The two-state solution is exactly what it sounds like. Two states for two peoples. One for Israelis, one for Palestinians. My vision is two states, living side by side. It's not a slogan. It is the only path to lasting peace. And it can be done. As an idea, it's been around for nearly a century. It even looked like it might be about to happen. It was the beginning of an astonishing new era in Middle East history and diplomacy. But it didn't. Israel is mourning the loss of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, assassinated by a Jewish extremist. And it's pretty much gone backwards ever since. The Middle East peace process is in deep trouble tonight, following some of the worst unrest since the end of the Intifada. Why is it so complicated? And why a two-state solution? Why not a one-state solution, like in Northern Ireland, which was another long-running, violent conflict that at times probably seems just as unsolved. Peace agreements are not fairy stories. Everyone doesn't get to live happily ever after. What the peace agreement did was stop the war. Well, more on that in a bit. First, let's do a bit of two-state one -on To make two states, you first of all need to create the new state of Palestine. And to do that, you've got to work out where its borders will go. The outside borders are already fixed. You've got Egypt and Jordan, which have peace treaties with Israel, as well as Syria and Lebanon, which very much do not. Now, after World War I, the land inside those borders was known as Palestine, and it was run by the British when they split the Middle East up with France in the divvy up of the old Ottoman Empire. Now, Britain had also just declared its support for the idea of a Jewish state, which did not impress the Arabs living in Palestine. Tensions turned to violence. The situation was rapidly getting out of control. Hardly a day passed without an Arab, a Jew or a British soldier being killed in a shooting raid or a terror bombing. By 1937, Britain was looking for a long-term solution. So it produced the first proposal to split Palestine into two states. A Jewish state in the north, an Arab state in the south, and an international zone for the holy sites in Jerusalem. But Britain soon realised that to actually make that happen would mean massive forced transfers of people and land, and especially of Arabs, and they rejected it anyway. The next attempt was after World War II, in the shadow of the Holocaust, in the newly formed United Nations. The UN Petition Plan also divided Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state, with Jerusalem once again carved out. Jewish leaders said yes, Arab leaders once again said no. But it made no difference. The UN Petition Plan passed the UN General Assembly, 33 votes in favour, 20 against, with 13 countries abstaining. The United Kingdom, abstain. Now one of those was Britain, which really set it apart from the rest of Europe, South America and the Anglosphere, including Australia, which mostly voted yes. The Arab and the Muslim world voted no, along with Greece, India and Cuba. The result of the vote sent both Jews and Arabs through the streets of Jerusalem. The Jews dancing in joy and the Arabs rioting in anger. On the 14th of May 1948, Israel declared its independence and almost immediately was invaded by Egypt, Syria, Lebanon and Iraq. What Israelis call the War of Independence, and Palestinians call the Nakba, the Arab word for catastrophe, when hundreds of thousands of them lost their land, their homes, and became refugees. When it was over, Israel had not only survived, it had captured another 5,000 square kilometres of territory. Egypt now controlled Gaza, Jordan controlled the West Bank, and half of Jerusalem. Now those borders are the so-called Green Line Map and it's really important because pretty much every proposal for a two-state solution since then has been based on getting back to something like that. And this changed massively in 1967, what was called the Six-Day War. 
The war of 1967 started when Israel launched a preemptive strike against Egypt's gathering forces. Jordan's King Hussein ignored Israel's warning to stay out of the conflict and launched his own raid against the half of Jerusalem already in Israel. Egypt, Jordan and Syria all attacked Israel and were all defeated in less than a week. Against numerically overwhelming odds, the Jewish forces crushed the Arabs. When it was over, Israel had taken Gaza and the Sinai from Egypt, as well as the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Jordan and most of the Golan Heights from Syria, effectively tripling the size of the territory under Israel's control. It would be a long way back to the borders of the Green Line map. But there were times it looked like it might actually happen. The alternative to peace in the Middle East is a future of violence and waste and tragedy. It took until 1991 for everyone to get in the same room and start talking about it. By now, the US was taking the lead. But those talks didn't go anywhere. But at the same time, there were other secret talks going on in Norway. And they did get somewhere. After nearly half a century of hatred, Israel and the PLO today signed documents of mutual recognition. The Oslo Accords didn't create a state of Palestine, but they were an agreement to have a serious crack at it. Together, today, with all our hearts and all our souls, we bid them shalom, salam, peace. Israel's Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin agreed to go back to the pre-war borders. Yasser Arafat, the leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, agreed to renounce terrorism and to recognize Israel's right to exist in peace. I believe the Lord has made us born to live in peace, not in war. In spite of all the difficulties which we had faced in the past, we had signed and we are committed to what we had signed. The Accords also started the process of setting up limited Palestinian self-rule with its own government and police force. But there was still a lot to agree on, and that included the most difficult issues of all. Palestinians wanted East Jerusalem as their capital. Would they get it? What would happen to the Israeli settlements that were built on Palestinian land? Was there a right of return for the Palestinians who lost their land and homes in 1948? Would a state of Palestine have a military? And what guarantees could Israel get that it could exist in peace and safety? Even so, this was a huge moment. Rabin, Arafat and Israel's foreign minister Shimon Peres were jointly awarded the 1994 Nobel Peace Prize. The job is difficult, complex, trying. Mistakes could topple the whole structure and bring disaster down upon us. The following year, Yitzhak Rabin was shot dead by an Israeli religious extremist opposed to the Oslo Accords. Then Hamas, in defiance of Yasser Arafat, launched a series of terror attacks against Israel. Five years later, Bill Clinton was coming to the end of his presidency, and he had one more go. He invited Yasser Arafat and the new Israeli PM, Ehud Barak, to Camp David. After all these years, as hard as these issues are, they don't want to give up. But they couldn't reach agreement on those most difficult details. The borders, security, the rights of Palestinian refugees, and perhaps most sensitive of all, how to share Jerusalem. The breakdown of those talks was followed by one of the worst waves of terror attacks in Israel's history, the Second Intifada. Even while that was going on, Arab countries put forward their own plan. The Arab Peace Initiative offered full recognition of Israel in exchange for a Palestinian state with its capital in East Jerusalem, once again based on those pre-war borders. Then in 2005, Israel unexpectedly began pulling all of its citizens out of Gaza. Almost immediately, Hamas took control, violently, and has been in charge of Gaza ever since. A few years after that, Barack Obama was in the White House and took his turn at trying to solve Middle East peace. The new Israeli Prime Minister was Benjamin Netanyahu. He 
sat in the Oval Office opposite the US President and set out a red line. While Israel is prepared to make generous compromises for peace, it cannot go back to the 1967 laws. Obama didn't directly respond at the time, but two days later, he did. The borders of Israel and Palestine should be based on the 1967 lines with mutually agreed swaps. Obama and Netanyahu never had a particularly good relationship, but it certainly ended far worse than it started. Netanyahu got along a lot better with Donald Trump. Donald Trump recognised all of Jerusalem as Israel's capital and even moved the US Embassy there. After Donald Trump recognised the Golan Heights as part of Israel... It should have taken place many decades ago. Benjamin Netanyahu named a settlement thereafter. As the years have passed, the prospect of a two-state solution has only become more remote, and perhaps never more so than now. Israel's ambassador to the UK pretty much ruled out a two-state solution for good. I think it's about time for the world to realise the Oslo paradigm failed on the 7th but, of October and we need to build a new one. And in but, order to build a new one... But does that new one include the Palestinians living in a state of their own? Does, think, is that what it includes? I think the biggest question is what type of Palestinians are on the other side? This is what Israel no, realised on the 7th of October. Though? The answer is absolutely no, and I'll tell you why. Well, then, because how can at there the be moment, peace in, no, how can I'll there be peace answer you. The reason there is no peace Israel. is because the Palestinians. How can, with, without offering Mark, a state to Palestine, how Mark, can there be peace in Israel? Israel knows today, and the world should know now. The reason the Oslo Accords failed is because the Palestinians never wanted to have a state next to Israel. They want to have a state from the river to the sea. Last year, Benjamin Netanyahu returned as Prime Minister creating a coalition that's been described as the most right-wing and religiously conservative in Israel's history. Utterly committed to the long and controversial practice of building Israeli settlements in areas of the West Bank. Under his government, approvals for 13,000 new housing units in the disputed territory were either approved or advanced, according to the Israeli watchdog Peace Now. On the other side, Palestinian politics is split. The West Bank is controlled by the Palestinian Authority. That's the government that was created under the Oslo Accords. The Authority is largely controlled by a party called Fatah. It's the party of Yasser Arafat. It's dominated Palestinian politics for decades. And the Palestinian Authority is not particularly popular amongst Palestinians. It's got a reputation for corruption, nepotism, and incompetence, let alone seemingly being unable to do anything to improve the situations or the lives of Palestinians in the occupied territories. The radical Islamic organisation Hamas is claiming a landslide victory in the elections in northern Gaza. In 2006, Fatah shocked its Western backers and Israel by losing an election to Hamas, an Islamist party that doesn't recognise Israel and is declared as a terrorist organisation by the US, the UK and Australia. The West responded to that election result by temporarily shutting off aid to the Palestinian Authority. Israel responded by arresting dozens of members of Hamas, including some who'd just been elected to the parliament. The following year, Fatah and Hamas literally went to war with each other in Gaza. When it was over, Hamas controlled Gaza, the Palestinian Authority had the West Bank, and that's how it's been ever since. And support for a two-state solution has tanked. There was a Gallup poll of Palestinians which ended just before the October 7th attacks. It showed support for a two-state solution at 25%. Now that's down from nearly 60% a decade ago. Supports also dropped among Jewish Israelis. So what's the alternative? Why not a one-state solution then? Well, here's what the then US Vice President Joe Biden said about that back in 2016. The actions that Israel's government has taken over the past several years, the steady and systematic expansion of settlements, 
They're moving us toward a one-state reality, and that reality is dangerous. That reality is riddled with profound questions about future political and demographic character of Israel. How would Israel remain a Jewish state if the majority of its population is Palestinian? And that's why most Jewish Israelis are also opposed to a one-state solution. So what do people want? Well, in 2019, the RAND Corporation held 33 focus groups in the region, and they tested five alternatives. The two-state solution, a one-state solution, a confederation, Israel annexing parts of Palestinian territory, and the status quo. Now, none of those options was acceptable to a majority of Israelis and Palestinians. Israelis preferred the status quo, but Palestinians hated it. It found that the most viable political alternative was the two-state solution, but it also found there was pretty heavy scepticism that it would ever happen. The only group that preferred a one-state solution over a two-state solution were Palestinians in Gaza, and even then, not by much. And that's why the two-state solution is still regarded is the only viable way out of this conflict. So where to from here? The UAE says it will help to rebuild Gaza, but it's put a condition on it, the progress of a US-backed initiative towards a two-state solution. And the US has been taking a tougher line with Israel, particularly on the issue of settlements. Advancing settlements in the West Bank undermines the prospects of a future Palestinian state and a two-state solution. As do any actions that undermine stability in the West Bank, including attacks by Israel, Israeli settlers against Palestinians and Palestinian attacks against Israelis. As President Biden has repeatedly said, those attacks are unacceptable. But if Donald Trump wins another term in the White House, that pressure will almost certainly back right off. Benjamin Netanyahu is deeply unpopular with Israelis, not just for the massive security failure on October 7th, but also for his recent attempt to try to nobble the Supreme Court, which was seen as a grasp for more power. The Palestinian Authority president, Mahmoud Abbas, is 88 years old. Whoever might replace both of those leaders, and whenever that happens, will face this massive challenge of uniting their own people before even thinking of uniting Israelis and Palestinians. Israel is a very different country today to the secular nation that was created in 1948. There are a lot more religious and nationalist citizens who believe that God literally gave all the land to them and who hold a lot more political power. A Palestinian leader would need to bridge that massive divide between Fatah and Hamas. Because as much as the world might condemn and reject Hamas for the atrocities of October the 7th, it's still there. And in fact, at moments like this, its popularity among Palestinians tends to go up. And that's before getting to those same difficult details that have tripped up every previous attempt borders, security, refugees, and Jerusalem. But there doesn't seem to be a better suggestion than to keep trying.